academic year. And so as a reminder, if you're a student enrolled in this as a class, you're, and if you're not taking a pass for pass, in other words, if you're taking it for a grade, your written, whatever you're going to do for the written assignment, the reflective journal or the paper, whichever you're choosing, is due by Tuesday, 5 p.m. Um, if you're taking it in CE, it goes to Robertini. If you're taking it in USP, it goes to me. So if you have any questions, let me know. So I want to remind you of that. And uh, without further ado, I am going to uh, hand it over to our speaker today, Jonathan Mackler, from both Metro and uh, PDOT to talk about transportation operations in the region. Thank you. Do I need to stand anywhere? Does it matter? Just not in front of the Not screen. in front of the screen. That'll be easy. I hope it's okay with you. Uh, I'm not PowerPoint phobic. I just sort of prefer on a Friday afternoon to be free of that. Um, so I've passed out the outline so that you can follow along with all those visual cues you'd normally get at the top of the PowerPoint slide. Um, but hopefully this means you can, you know, I can have your attention instead of the screen having your attention a little bit. Um, and if you lapse off, you can enjoy the cartoon that I stole from the New Yorker at the bottom of your outline. I thought that was pretty fun. Um, as Jennifer said, I uh, am sort of both affiliated with uh, City of Portland and Metro. Um, this is the, the benefit of a grant that the region got from the Federal Highway Administration. So I am employed by the City of Portland and housed at Metro. And as I get into the talk, I'll be talking a lot about the importance of interagency collaboration. So some of my colleagues have teased me that I'm sort of a one-man interagency squad trying to make some ties between agencies. That's a bit of a theme, but I think it's, it's, it bespeaks something about the way that this region approaches transportation operations, that even the position that they got a grant for is housed at two different agencies. So I find that to be a good thing, and if you have any questions about it, or about either agency, and how they do, how they're involved in operations, I'd be happy to address that. Uh, where I wanted to start today, um, where I started with this job, is answering the question of what is transportation operations. Uh, a lot of us are involved in transportation planning, uh, some are involved in operations, and sometimes those two fields are a bit like oil and water, or at least they just haven't come into contact with each other so far. So I thought I'd start uh, sort of the way I plan on talking through the seminar is by asking you a question uh, of, I'm going to have a couple of these for you, a little interactive, I don't know how normal that is, um, but you have your microphone so you can buzz in. Um, there are no prizes. Uh, unlike some other meetings I've run, there is no candy to hand out, even though it is Friday. Um, but I hope for your participation. So what are some of your thoughts? Some of you are ringers. You've already been through this part of the talk. But what are your thoughts about what constitutes transportation operations? And you have, or maybe any thoughts about what it's not? Is the, is the uh, new Columbia River crossing transportation operations? Or is that a, maybe a major capital long-term investment? If that's at one end of the spectrum, if that's a capital project, and operations at the other end, of the, it might be at the other end of the spectrum. What might be down here? Jennifer, a ringer. <laughs> I don't know, actually. How about signal timing? <laughs> signal timing, I think, would be a great example. Anybody else have others? Chris, you said something about your web page? Incident management. OK, incident management would be an example of operations. Anybody have any other thoughts? Traveler information. Traveler information. Chris is in favor of that one. <laughs> Some of the, what the, oh, yeah. Peter? Temporary traffic control for construction. Festivals, <laughs> for example, or special events of any kind. That's right. These are all examples of things that, one short way of putting it, is things you do after you've built the system, right? We build highways, we build transit, we have bike paths, sidewalks, all kinds of facilities. But once you've built that, how does it work? You know, sometimes we build infrastructure and we've designed it carefully and it just doesn't work exactly the way we wanted it to. And so we need to find sort of non-concrete, non-steel ways to make it work better. Uh, some people like to say that congestion represents a loss of the capacity that we've built, and we want to regain that capacity. And operations is part of the strategy for making our existing infrastructure work better. Does that make sense? Are you sort of with me here? So I think it's helpful. Some people want an answer for what is transportation operations that's really specific. I think it's hard to give that answer because I think of it as a, as a sort of a range of transportation decision making. We make decisions like the Columbia River crossing, a major bridge, or ma you know, we're building uh, a lot of transit in the region right now. These are decisions that we take years to make and they last generations in terms of how long the product of that decision lasts. Other decisions like changing signal timing, you could probably make that decision rather quickly and it might only last for 
a special event. It might last a couple of hours. It might last a couple of days. Or if there's a construction site that, like the NATO Parkway or the Burnside Bridge that's going to be there for a while, it might last a matter of months or years. So it, I think it's helpful to think about the difference between transportation planning and transportation operations on some of those variables, like how long it takes to make the decision and how long the product of that decision lasts. So that's, that's, the, that's my framework for thinking about it, and if that helps you, um, that might be good. Certainly there's other ways to think about it, too. The uh, second thing, um, do you, I don't know, I'm a very linear thinker, so that I like the uh, hierarchical outline. Um, if that doesn't, you know, on a Friday afternoon, that might not flow too well for you, so just bear with me. There's a term that's come out recently. I'm sure you're aware that there's new federal transportation legislation, Safety Lou, that came out in August of 2005. And when new legislation comes out, there's usually new terms or new ideas that are thrown around. Uh, in 1991, intermodalism was kind of all the rage with ICT. Uh, under Safety Lou, one of the terms that was slipped in there is something called uh, Transportation System Management and Operations, TISMO. Follow T-S-M-O. TISMO, I like acronyms that you can just sort of say in one word. So TISMO isn't really a new concept. I mean, we've certainly heard plenty about transportation system management, transportation demand management. In fact, if you open the current version of Metro's Long Range Transportation Plan, there's a policy that says managing the transportation system. It's divided into two halves. One is TSM and one is TDM. And so if you probably are familiar with examples of TDM, uh, trans uh, transportation demand management, a lot of pricing strategies, uh, things that you do to influence people's behavior, uh, ride sharing, uh, a lot of marketing, travel information. Then there's things that you do on the transportation system management that you try to do to work with the infrastructure, as I said before, things you do to make your infrastructure work better. So traditionally, TDM and TSM sort of made the two halves the whole. In Safety Lou and in work that Federal Highway Administration has been doing lately, the last few years, there's been this new term, TISMO. And um, many people have asked for, you know, what is TISMO? What falls under that category? And there's a great diagram that they have that's called a TISMO galaxy. You know, they couldn't come up with, you know me, I like to have these hierarchical, you know, uh, layered lists. It just has examples sort of scattered. Because TISMO encompasses a lot of things. Parking management, it actually lists demand management, which is a little mind-bending for me. Uh, uh, we talked about uh, pricing on highways, traveler information, incident management, a lot of the things we talked about. So I think it's important, you know, when you're confronted with this term, and when I use this term in other talks, People who have been working in this field for a long time say, how is TISMO different from TSM? We've been doing TSM for a generation or more. And I think the answer is that it's not really that different. It's the same concept, new term. Um, but when you have to play by the rules in order to get the money, you have to use the terminology that comes with the money. So TISMO is the term for uh, at least a few years with us here. And I think it's a useful one. I want to ask you a question here uh, that I usually get which has to do with the relationship between TISMO, in that it's this galaxy of things we do to make the infrastructure work better, and intelligent transportation systems, which I know a lot of you are involved with. Uh, Robert Tini has the ITS lab. I know some of the students here are directly involved in that. I want to know what your thoughts are between, about the relationship between system management and operations and intelligent transportation systems. Let's use incident management, the example that Chris brought up. Incident management is a great example of TISMO. I mean, this is something, we, you know, you have, the, you have the infrastructure out there, it's working, there's a bad accident, all of a sudden it grinds to a halt. Traffic's gridlocked. Okay, so incident management might be a set of strategies that you use to get that back online. Um, you might have seen the Comet trucks out there that come out and they help you fi fix your flat tire, or they clear a car off the side of the road. What's the relationship between incident management and sort of those activities and intelligent transportation systems and the various you know, devices and infrastructure associated with it. Yeah. Well, um, ITS will be used you know, to basically disseminate the information you know, in advance before you, know, you get more traffic you know, converging on the spot where the problem is. So by ITS, you mean like the signs over the, the signs, highway or yeah. the radio or the web pages, radio, things like that? Page, you know, okay, uh, so camera shots. So like the, the various hardware associated with ITS. Okay, I think that's a really good point. Anybody have any other ideas they want to add to that? Well, oh. Yeah, leave the teacher out of it. <laughs> I, I, it, it, would, it would seem to me like you've got a, a bunch of different building blocks, and so then 
However, you if you think of ITS as being the hardware and the and the and the, the plan to use it in that particular way, then that's another building block. But if you think of intelligence as being a, the guiding principles for the whole system, then maybe there maybe there isn't a difference. So it, it probably depends on how you on how you break it down. I think we're probably more comfortable with 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 your idea that ITS is is the reader boards and the plans for the reader boards, and then and then there'd be other things that would be emergency responder plans mm -hmm. that would that would include that, but would be a larger uh, a, a bigger picture. Jennifer, did you want to add something to that? Well, I was just, it, it, it's a good question because I was trying to think of my mind. I don't know if I know a good definition of ITS, but also the technology not just to let people know what's going on, but to detect the incident in the first place. Mm -hmm. I think what we're, we're, we're painting a picture. And so if I, the, the way I think about it, since I think about it 24 hours, or well, at least eight hours a day, maybe not 24, uh, the way I think about it is that the technologies, as you described, the building blocks, I think is a great term, those are the technologies that enable the systems. So incident management is like a service. You look, at a, you look at traffic on the highway and you say, when there's an accident and it creates all this delay, how can, we, how can we improve that situation? How can we make it so that when there's an accident, we clear that accident faster, we notify people that there is an accident so they can seek alternate routes? You can think about the outcomes associated with it, right? You want, you want, delay, you want accidents to last not as long. You want fewer cars to get tangled up in them. You want fewer secondary crashes, you know, fender benders as cars kind of accordion into that, you know, uh, congested zone. Those are the services. I think the technologies are the things that enable the services. So another example that I like to talk about is uh, something like pricing. We don't have a lot of, it's a big discussion item here, right? We don't have a lot of tolling on our highways. I moved here last year from the East Coast where pretty much all the major highways are priced or tolled. Now, you don't need, you know, tolling a highway might be an operational strategy. You might say, let's have a toll here so that people only use this interstate highway for their long distance trips or for certain kinds of trips, or let's have a higher toll at the peak period, you know, rush hour, rather than during the off-peak period. That's an operational strategy. You can also use technology to make your pricing program work better. You can have electronic transponders so that the car can just drive through the toll plaza and skim right through it. Another example that I've been talking about recently or that I've been hearing a lot about recently in Portland is parking. You know, you come downtown, you want to find a parking spot. How do you know where, you know, how, how do you decide where to go for parking? I personally, still being new to the area, drive across the Broadway Bridge and just start looking for parking signs and I grab the first thing I find. I've heard a statistic recently, not specific to Portland, that 30% of congestion in the downtown area is related to people looking for a parking spot. You know, now you can put up signs that say there's a parking garage here or there's a parking garage there. It's a very low-tech strategy for helping people find parking efficiently. But if you've traveled in Europe and a few cities in the United States, you've seen signs that say as you come into a city, you know, parking garage number one over here, parking garage number two over there, and parking garage number three over there. And then there's real-time numbers that say how many available parking spots there are. So you look at parking garage number one and it says zero. <laughs> you don't want to go there. Parking garage number two has 674 spots. That's a good idea. We're about to see a system like that open up at the Portland International Airport. So I think what we're talking about in the difference between TISMO and ITS, TISMO, Transportation System Management and Operations, are the strategies and the activities that you do to try to make the system work better. It's helpful to think of ITS, the technology and the hardware, as enabling those activities. Does that fit some of the way that you were talking about it? One, I, sure, go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah. So I'm sort of thinking in a Venn diagram and uh, okay. thinking TSM and, and ITS is sort of completely fitting under that. But would there be cases of ITS examples that are not TSM or TISMA? Well, what do you think? I don't know. Anybody else? Can anybody think? Uh, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, um, on, yep, here. Well, if we're going to consider ITS to be a, a, a block, then I can't see that there would be any way to use it without having a plan. Mm -hmm. So I would say that in the Venn diagram, the TISMO is the universe, and then the, the ITS is one of the circles in there. I think the history, you know, the relatively recent history of ITS, is that there are deployments that were made for the sake of putting gizmos in the field. You know, 
And that's the reason that some people have sort of a, I don't know, allergy. You know, there's a, there's a, there's sometimes a resistance to investing in technology because it has a reputation of being technology for technology's sake. And I think you could certainly point to some instances of ITS where someone said, hey, look at this great gadget that we can buy. It's really neat. Let's put it out there. Before thinking about what they wanted it, what service they wanted it to render. One, one of the ways that I like to think about that is differentiating between outputs and outcomes. You, know, you can think about the fact that we have transmitted so many messages on our, on our message signs over the highway, right? Or we've posted this, or we've retimed our signals. I think those, of those as outputs. What we really want to think about are the outcomes. You know, when we post that sign on the highway, is the result that people avoid the congestion, or do they just drive right past it and ignore it? You know, when we uh, change signal timings to accommodate a construction zone, is it effective, or does it, you know, did it work well, or did it not work well? And so I think maybe one of the ways to think about um, this issue, and it, it's broader than ITS, is I think it's helpful to think about outcomes when you're trying to figure out what you want to do with operations. Okay, I want to move ahead. A lot of these themes are just going to keep coming up, so we'll have plenty of opportunity to bring them up again. Uh, I put something that I, th I thought was witty for Friday, whence the fuss? You know, um, that has to do with this idea that Tismo is not new, but uh, sort of a new spin on it. And I, I think that there's, there's some good reasons why recently, whether it's at the statewide level, federal level, statewide level, at the metro, uh, you know, the regional setting for the city, for individual jurisdictions, all of a sudden, there's a lot of talk about operations. Uh, you've probably heard about or looked at the Oregon Transportation Plan. Right up front in sort of the preamble, it talks about managing the transportation system, sort of the same rhetoric that, we, that, we're, that we're using here today. And I wonder what your thoughts are on why, why is operations, or TISMO, why is this so hot right now? Why, are, why is there so much attention to coming up with strategies that are alternatives to capacity expansions? Okay, let's start down here. Was well, it cheaper than capacity, than expanding the capital costs of expanding the capacity? I certainly think the advocates would say, you know, if you're, if you're faced with a bottleneck, um, you know, like a signal time example, if you have a, if a facility that's not working well and you say, well, we need more capacity, the volume is just crushed, it might be cheaper to coordinate your signal system so that the traffic flows through more smoothly than adding a lane to a highway or a street. So I think cost effectiveness is an important argument. Yeah. That was yours, okay. Cost effectiveness covered, another, Chris? Well, of course we have a whole revolution in communications technology, so a lot of things are possible now that weren't 10 or 20 years ago. Yeah, so in other words, it's changing the way that we travel. Okay, yep, yeah. there, um, there are physical limitations in terms of how much we can expand the system. Right, I think that's right. I think sometimes there are physical limitations and also sometimes there's a um, either a lack of uh, political will or popular support for expanding. You know, you took, look at the Terwilliger curves, you, you just can't, you know, what are you going to do? Where are you going to widen it? Um, but there are also places where there's plenty of space, but there's a decision by whatever agency that we'd rather not widen that. We'd ra you know, um, in the 205 corridor, there's space for, I think, four lanes of highway, but as a region, we decided we'd like to use some of that space to put in light rail. So there's, there are trade-offs that are made. So I think that physical and also uh, political considerations. Any other thoughts? Yeah, Peter? We, we now have the computer capacity to make analysis of the measures of, effect, of effectiveness, perhaps, that we, that we didn't have before. Right. I think on that point, um, one of the things I was thinking about, obviously here at PSU with the uh, ITS lab, to me there's a newness of that analytical capability, you know, the, that we're generating all this data, that we know so much about the system in real time, that enables us to do these things, but also it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting new activity. There's, there's lots of new stuff happening. You know, things that the Internet enables that we didn't have five or ten years ago or even a year ago, you know, expanding our capacity in terms of getting real-time information in from hardware in the field. I think these are all really these, – these, that's exactly the list that I had prepared. I wrote shortage of money, uh, lack of ability or desire to expand capacity, um, the newness of the data and analytical capabilities. And then I, I put in one more, which is another, I think, sort of fad or hot topic right now, which is that there's a growing awareness, I think, although it might be a inside, inside the bubble mentality, that have, have you all heard about, if you heard, are you, are you sick of hearing about recurring versus non-recurring congestion? Is that something that's old saw to you? Is that something that comes in, in the classroom? Is that 
repeated a lot, or is that a new, you know, is that new to anybody? Recurring versus non-recurring? Fantastic. So, <laughs> guinea pigs. Perfect for a Friday afternoon, right? So, um, how would you feel about driving uh, north on I-5 to Washington in about three hours? Good. Not very good. That would frighten me. That would frighten you. That's recurring congestion. Guaranteed every Friday afternoon, I-5 north. Well, probably most afternoons, right? We, we know we could probably list off here as a group the top congested locations in the region, right? We know where there's intersections that don't work or ramps that get crowded. I mean, we have an Interstate 84 that just comes in and stops, right? So those are some recurring congestion locations. On the alternative, we have congestion that occurs when there's an accident, when there's bad weather and roads become slick, uh, when there's construction, when there's a festival. Things that you may know about, they're coming, like the festival, but they're not, they're not recurring. So you want to respond to recurring versus non-recurring congestion differently. And this is something, going back to that idea about the uh, data and analytical capabilities, we sort of kn we've always sort of known that that was the case, but now we're getting a much better understanding of exactly how that phenomenon works, knowing exactly how much of the congestion that we see in the region is attributable to you know, basic, basically chronic rush hour traffic volumes versus non-recurring. And if, you know, there's national statistics, statistics excuse me, and regional statistics, and it's usually on the order of 40 to 50 percent of delay is non-recurring, which I found surprising the first time I heard it. I've heard it about 175 times since, so I've gotten kind of bored of that fact. But the first time you think 50 percent of the delay on our, on our highway system is related to non-recurring congestion, and non-recurring congestion is the kind of stuff that can be most easily fixed by TISMO, by operation strategies that help address congestion or retime signals, things like that. Where I'm going with this is that I think there are a couple of factors that have made system management and operations sort of a hot topic right now. I think that's why it got attention in the federal legislation. I think we're generally in a tight fiscal time in terms of transportation funding. Well, we're in a tight fiscal time in the public sector period, but particularly in transportation. There's a lot of discussion about the federal government backing out of transportation funding. In this region and many others, we're hearing about uh, you know, private sectors getting involved in transportation funding. So there's a lot of stuff that's happening that's making system management and operations very appealing at the moment. But I have sort of a word of caution, well, sort of a word of, of hope and caution at the same time, and it's what I mean by realizing a window of opportunity. I think there's instances, I'm speaking of in transportation, which is my area of expertise, where there's a, there's a window of opportunity like this for TISMO. You know, the, the, sort of the forces have kind of combined right now to make this a really good time to be talking about this. We're very concerned about congestion. We're very aware of fiscal constraint. We have these uh, new and growing technical capabilities. So we, we sort of have the, the need and the means to talk about this. And so it makes it, it, I don't know if you'll permit me, it makes it sexy right now to talk about system management and operations. And signal timing isn't always sexy. I think you might probably all agree. Uh, and that, oh, <laughs> hopefully my boss isn't watching. Since I work in the signals and street lighting division, there's a whole crew groaning over at the city of Portland. Right? Sorry, Bill. Um, so you know, the the where we are right now, the issues that we're facing make Tismo particularly appealing. But I I have some concern that when you hitch your you know your cart to a particular horse, sometimes it doesn't last. So if there's if there's something really exciting, like right now we're talking about how. There's no money to spend, so we have to do system management and operations because it's cost effective. Well, we're not all, I don't think we're always going, I don't think we can assume that we're always going to be in a fiscally constrained environment. So if we hitch the rationale for doing management and operations only to fiscal constraint, if you take away the fiscal constraint, there's not a very strong argument for doing operations. I think when you, rec when you say we're in a window of opportunity to do something, it could be anything, but in this case it's, it's management and operations, I think it's important to, like anything, diversify your portfolio. So we should make this issue not just about congestion, but also about, uh, you know, we talked about physical constraints. You know, you're always going to have places where you can't expand capacity. We're always going to be dealing with uh, congestion. We're always going to have that, uh, at least in this region, uh, a strong political desire to seek alternatives to expanding roadway capacity. So the first instinct, I think, is to say, look, we have this fantastic window of opportunity to get really excited about TISMO. But at the same time, I think we need to be a little bit cautious that we don't get, get kind of overdo it uh, using you know, any one particular reason. Does that make sense? I don't know if did anybody have other feelings about it. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering if you could 
I actually think there always will be fiscal constraints, <laughs> but um, it, it seems like you could make an argument just on principle and maybe even throw in sustainability that you should be operating your system most efficiently to reduce the use of more resources. Even if you had the money to build more, mm -hmm. just on principle that you should operate as efficiently as possible. Okay. Yeah. Well, if, if, we, if we look at the likely future price of fuel, though, a lot of our congestion problems may solve themselves. If, if we've got 1.3 occupants per vehicle now, and that went to 2.6 because people realize that they just can't afford to drive around, there's half the cars gone from the road. Mm -hmm. That's going to solve a lot of congestion problems. When you go back to Chris's comment about information technology enabling different travel behaviors, which might not, it is a powerful force, might not be so powerful a force as $7 a gallon for gas. Um, so. but, but they work together right. because at the same time that people are saying, I can't afford the $7 per gallon gas, they're also able to hook up with each other on the Internet on, on, on in, you know, right. car sharing schemes. Yeah, have alternatives. Right. Well, I want to, this was sort of one segment. This was, this was number one, and I have a few more. Uh, but this was really sort of the theoretical uh, foundation for the topic. I, since I wasn't quite sure what people would know about transportation operations and how it fits into other things, I wanted to cover that in some detail. Um, before I move on, does anybody, you know, if this is the theory and we're going to go into practice a little bit, does anybody have questions before we go? Okay. Well, as you've been doing, keep asking questions as they come up. Um, the next topic is planning for operations. And I think we've, as, as I expected, we've sort of already stumbled onto this. We, we talked earlier about, you know, not doing technology for technology's sake, but having a plan, having a reason for doing that. I think the, the logic behind planning for operations is the same, why we want to think ahead and, and be strategic about this. But to, to, to approach that question, I, I first wanted, since I know some of you are in, some of you come from an ITS background, and for, I guess that's the civil engineering versus urban studies differentiation. For, for some of you who are, especially for those of you who are planners, here's the broad question, $64,000 question. It seems like so little these days, unless you're buying gas. Uh, why do we plan? If, if I need to limit it a little bit, why do we plan transportation? I don't need to, you know, get into other aspects of your lives. Any ideas why we plan? <laughs> do we have a transportation planner from the city of Portland here? <laughs> Jean? <laughs> That'll teach you to sit next to someone in an in a orange T-shirt. I know it. I know it. That always worries me. Um, well, if you think about how our transportation system gets built, it get, gets built over a long period of time. And what you're trying to do is anticipate what you're going to need at what time in the future. And that's really what we're doing when we're doing transportation planning. Right. I, I think that was even, I had, a, I had a phrase prepared, but the way you just said it, anticipating your needs in the future is, is even better because that applies, you know, we, we're used in planning to thinking about it in the context of, okay, we're going to have population growth in this direction, do we need to provide infrastructure to connect, you know, housing and jobs? And it's, you know, isn't it the same? Can't we imagine that same question or that, that same expression in the context of operations? You know, what are we going to need? You know, once you have the infrastructure, what are we going to need? How is this infrastructure going to work? And therefore, how do we need to operate it? You know, how do we operate it now and how do we operate it in the future? So I, that was a, all right, I, maybe I do have some candy. <laughs> Does anybody have any other? <laughs> Does anybody have any other reasons for why we plan transportation? Well, I take a little bit of a contrarian view because the, the statement was out there. It's characterized as what I would call the predicted provide theory of planning. Uh, the other way, of course, is to uh, choose the outcomes you want and plan towards those rather than sort of be plan reactively to what, you know, if, if you think you're a dependent variable in the system as opposed to being, you know, an independent variable. I would say what you have in common is that planning is based on thinking about the, you know, having a vision, whether it's kind of normative or positive, and working towards that. Yep. Well, you usually can't get funding without a plan. <laughs> Very good point. <laughs> a pragmatic contributor in the back. Any other comments about why we, why we plan transportation? Well, some of the other thoughts that I had, um, we've talked about, one of mine was create and achieve a common vision. I think that planning is a way that we uh, reduce cost of providing transportation services. 
we think, you know, the, the reason we plan, you know, I sit at Metro where we have many stakeholders come together at one table. We want to think about, okay, if agency A is going to do something and agency B is going to do something, do they connect? We want to, we want to get together at the planning table to make sure that what one party is doing matches what another party is doing. Sometimes because if you don't talk to each other, you're going to build redundant systems or you're going to build systems that don't connect. I've heard many examples of um, neighboring um, bus systems, you know, where people want to go from here to there, and the buses come out this way, and the buses come out this way, and they're about a quarter mile apart. And the service operators didn't talk and realized that they could make the turnaround over here, and now people could make that transfer. So there's planning because it just it can reduce the cost of, of providing service, or it can provide better service. It can provide better service to the user. So there's one you know there's one reason to plan for the provider, and there's another rationale for planning to the, on the user end. I think one of the other uh, important things about transportation planning is engaging stakeholders, right? I mean, there's plenty of times where you can take your technical experts and lock them away in a building. Some people think that's what Metro's about. I disagree. You know, you, you take your technical experts, and they could, we could do a plan, right? We could probably close the door right now and come up with a transportation plan for Portland. But that influences an awful lot of people, right? And it matters that those people have a stake in the plan that shapes their region. I mean, as Chris said, there's different ways to think about, do we want to plan for the trends or do we want to plan for where we want to be? Well, do you want to consult your cons the people who are going to live in that future, right? So it's essential to plan in a way that you engage your stakeholders so they have some, st they have some stake in it as stakeholders, right? So I think there's a couple of different rationales, and we're used to those in transportation planning. I mean, transportation planning, because you need the money, right? You need the money, so you need to, you need to have a transportation planning process. That's the way it's set up. In transportation operations, it's a little different, though. A lot of transportation operations doesn't run on a forward, what well, doesn't run on a strategic forward thinking. You know, there's a lot of times in operations where, you know, that construction zone was going to go up and we had a plan for it, but now it's been by, delayed by a week or it's been moved up by a week or something didn't work out quite right or the water main burst or whatever, right? So how do you, I mean, you have, you've got to go in real time. You know, as a planner, when I'm in meetings with operators, it's not uncommon for some of them to have to take, you know, they get their page, they've got three pagers and a, phone, and a cell phone on their, on their belt that they've got to go take because there's been a crash or there's been a breakdown or something, and it, it's got to get fixed this moment. So operations is a real, you know, by the seat, of, it can be a real by the seat of your pants. Now, imagine, just, I think, I don't even think I have to tell you, but you can imagine easily how when you're working in sort of a brush fire mode, it's easy to just be kind of, looking a reasonable distance in front of you, but not have the time in your day to think strategically into the future. And what we've talked about, those same rationales for planning the, the capital decision making are the, is the same rationale for planning operations. You want to think about achieving your vision. You know, how is this going to work? Either how it's kind of on the trend to work or how you actually want to make it work. You want to figure out a way to reduce your costs, right? I mean you could go out there and come up with an operation scheme because you just had to slap something together. And it works, but it might cost a little more because you didn't have time to think it through and figure out how would be the best way to do it. Or you didn't have time to check with a partner who might have a cheaper way of doing it. You also want to figure out whether you're providing the best possible service to your users. You know, what you come up with the first time might be very good, but it might not be the best thing. And so having more time to plan and think out strategically might allow you to enhance the service you provide. The fourth one, the engage the stakeholders, I haven't quite figured out how that applies to planning for operations. So you'll permit me, you'll, you'll forgive me if I let that one sweep onto the table. But I think that basically the rationale for planning for transportation, which is conventional, taught in school, used all the time, relatively familiar to people who are involved in transportation planning, citizens and so forth, is pretty much the same rationale that applies to planning for operations. Okay, achieving your vision, reducing costs, improving services. So, I think that we establish why we plan, why we plan for operations. There's, I just want to throw in one more, I'm, I'm throwing terms at you, but one of these terms that you may or may not be familiar with is systems engineering. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Systems engineering. Um, here's another term, common sense. <laughs> I was, uh, I remember once going, I think it was a summer camp, and they said, uh, use common sense, and if you don't have anybody, if you don't have any, borrow somebody else's. Systems engineering is essentially common sense writ large. Um, a classic example in the ITS context is that you're going to go out and you're going to buy one of those message signs, you know, to go over your highway that you can use to say, take this detour, that detour. There are some uh, infamous instances, I'll say, where an agency's gone out and bought the sign only to find out that the road that it often 
uh, announces as the detour uh, doesn't fit onto that screen, right? So there wasn't thinking through the process. You want to provide a service, you're going to buy some technology to perform that service, but you didn't buy the right thing for the job. Now you've spent money, and you're going to have to go out and buy a new one. Um, another example, um, I'm not sure if you're aware, we have a system in Portland here so that if there's a bus, TriMet bus running behind schedule and the light's about to turn red, uh, it automatically triggers the signal to extend the green light so that the bus can stay on schedule rather than sit at the red light for 30 or 40 seconds, right? Well, what would happen if the agency that puts up the traffic signal uh, used a brand that wasn't compatible with the equipment that's on the bus to trigger the signal? Well, that would be a waste of money and you wouldn't be providing the, the user services. This is essentially what comes under the heading of systems engineering. Um, I think that sometimes when you talk to planners about systems engineering, they say, well, isn't that what we always do? I mean, if we're going to decide to put a roadway out there, don't we think through the implications? I think it's routine in, in planning. That's basically what we do. We take, a, we take a problem and we look at it. We kind of walk around it and take, kind of take it in from all angles and think about all the aspects. In operations, as I said, a lot of operations is in that brush fire mentality. There isn't always time to walk all the way around it and decide how it looks. There's a different approach. And so systems engineering is something that's being implemented by pretty much every operating agency with operating responsibility to implement that sort of what I would call common sense approach to thinking through the entire problem. So I think that's a term that I hope you take away is a systems engineering term. So you've gotten two terms now, right? TISMO and systems engineering. I've got one more for you waiting in the wings. We'll get there in a little bit. So I think, the, I think an important reason for why we plan for operations comes under that heading of systems engineering thinking about the problem from all around. Okay, so then my final question in this section is why, we, we've covered why do we plan, why do we plan for operations, and so the final little bit that we add on to that statement is why do we plan for operations regionally? So City of Portland does its operations planning, hi Bill. Uh, ODOT does its uh, operations planning, TriMet, lots of other agencies. Why is it important for different agencies and different jurisdictions to plan together. Yeah. I'll give an example of what we look at at ODOT <clears throat> when we have a bunch of uh, what we call bridge replacement bundles uh, through uh, the OTO projects. They look at each bridge individually and you need traffic control in front of each bridge in both directions to warn the motorists of what's going on ahead. A lot of times we'll build three or four bridges on a corridor at the same time, and what we'll do is take the individual traffic control message boards, we'll replace them, and put in a permanent board, message board, prior to the corridor. Uh, it can be cost effective, cheaper uh, to put in one permanent message than paying for a bunch of individual uh, boards for each project, and when the bridges are built, you have a device that will last another 20 years to warn motorists of uh, problems in that corridor. Do have any other examples? Chris? I'll give a simpler answer, which is that streets don't stop at political boundaries. <laughs> I, think that's, that's, uh, I think that's one that probably resonates with people. I know I live, on MLK, I live right off of MLK in northeast Portland. I know exactly how to time my signals, I know what speed to go up MLK, so I just hit green light after green light. How frustrating would it be if you are following, you, you hit one of those streets that has great coordinated signals and you cross a political jurisdiction and the next jurisdiction doesn't coordinate their signals and you've been hitting green lights and then come to stop. Wouldn't it be nice if Portland, when you know, when Portland and Gresham side by side and they've coordinated those so you just keep running right through. Think about the uh, transit buses that we just talked about having their ability to uh, get priority in a traffic signal. Imagine if every jurisdiction in the region put different uh, signal technology so that when the bus goes from the city of Portland into uh, the city of Beaverton or the city of Gresham or when the uh, C-Tran bus goes from Portland back up into Clark County into Vancouver, imagine if they have to have a different gadget for every different kind of signal head. The driver wouldn't be able to see out of the front of the window. So there's lots of instances in which, like the other things we've talked about, Reduce cost, improve services if you collaborate. As Chris said, I don't think users care about jurisdictional boundaries. I mean, when you're driving, you don't care whether you're on a state road or a city road, county road, you name it. Anybody have any other examples they want to throw out there of why we plan for operations regionally? 
Let me go back to an example we talked about before, incident management. Would it make sense for, I'll use an even more uh, kind of fun example, or not so fun example, but vivid example, um, emergency response, evacuation planning. If the city of Portland had its own evacuation plan, what might that involve if it didn't coordinate with its partners? Drive them out to the city line and drop them, right? Doesn't make much sense. I mean, what if you have an evacuation where everybody's got to go east, you know, or the volcano goes and we've got to go south? Well, how much fun would it be if, uh, you know, ODOT Region 1 has the, all of I-5 lanes turned around to go south to get everybody evacuated, and then the next region down I-5 hasn't gotten that memo, and they've still got traffic going north? Wouldn't be a very good scenario. So there's pretty distinct reasons why different agencies or even different parts of the same agency talk to each other so that these operational strategies mesh. Does that make sense? That was a nice short little unit, the why do we plan section. So finally, we get to some tangible Portland-specific examples. Um, so aptly titled The Portland Story for Section 3. Um, I think we've covered a lot. I was going to, this is going to be my next little pop quiz question was for some examples of TISMO and ITS in the region. But I think we've, we've hit quite a few of them. Is anybody eager to mention another ITS or TISMO program that they're familiar with in the region? Just aching their pet project? Yeah. The camera system. A great example. So we have, I don't know the number, uh, but we have cameras really throughout the region, especially on the highways, but um, on train platforms and other places um, that are essential, we've talked about incident management, are, are a really critical part of knowing what's happening out on the region, out, out on the system, excuse me. Um, was there anywhere else you wanted to go with bringing up that example? Well, just that that was, there's, it's a ring network and there was really a, a, a tremendous amount of planning and, and interagency cooperation that went into the fiber optic ne network right. that, that makes that whole system work together. One of the things, um, you might all, it might be one of those things that's banal being from this region, but one of the things that people outside the region really admire is the fiber optic cable network that we have here. And it's really a, it's probably one of the best examples that we have of collaborative planning, where let's say you have a traffic camera. Have you, does anybody use uh, the TripCheck, ODOT's TripCheck website, you know, if you're going up to Mount Hood for skiing or something, and you go and you look at the cameras to see how the conditions are? Okay, so great, you put a camera out there. How is it that you get that camera feed on your computer? What does that take? It takes a communications infrastructure, right? That signal has to get from that camera down the mountain and in here. Now, there's some, wire, there's some ability to do wireless transmission, but video is pretty data intensive. We have a fiber optic network in the region that has enabled us to, at a very uh, efficient cost, deploy a lot of this ITS infrastructure. And one of the really remarkable things about that is that it's been done collaboratively. ODOT, when they were building their first link, came off the highway and needed to get to their headquarters, Region 1 headquarters, which is down at uh, first, uh, first in Flanders. Well, they had to go about two blocks across city streets, right? So they, were, they came to the city of Portland and said, okay, we've got this network. We need to get it across two blocks of city streets to get into our building. And the city of Portland said, well, this would be really great. Let's collaborate on this. If, you're gonna, if we're going to do this fiber optic network and you're going to have it go all the way out to the east side, well, we have some infrastructure out there we'd like to be able to communicate with. So we'll let you run under the city streets if we can use part of the network to communicate with our devices out in the field. And through the years, we've developed this very comprehensive network so that if you want to put a device out, if you want to just put a camera somewhere new, Camera doesn't cost very much, right? But the cost of having a camera that connects all the way back to your operations center costs a lot if you have to go out and dig a trench and lay in a fiber optic cable. But because PDOT and ODOT and TriMet and others have contributed to the construction of this fiber optic network in the region, sort of, oh, you're out there digging, you know, digging up a roadway to re repave the roadway, why don't you lay in some fiber while you're out there? Very low cost since you've already got the equipment out there. Bit by bit, we've built this fiber network, and now when you want to put a camera out there, you just have to connect it to the nearest part or, you know, the nearest hub on that network. A very cost of, I mean, that's something that is the envy of other regions in the country. So it might just sort of be, you might not be surprised when you see cameras really throughout the region, but that's really there because of this collaboration among agencies. And that's a fantastic example of uh, planning regionally. I think some of the other examples that I often bring up, uh, the Comet incident management trucks is a great example that illustrates the relationship between so the TISMO, the management and operations, and the ITS. You know, a truck that comes out and gives you a gallon of gas or fixes your tire, I don't think that's an example of ITS. But the reason that that truck is there 
very quickly after you break down is that there's loop detectors in the pavement that noticed that traffic started slowing down, which alerted someone at the operations center that there might be a problem, who panned the camera around to look at your specific spot, who was able to verify that the reason there's a slowdown is that there's a single car with a flat tire, which requires a comet truck. Quite different than if the camera tilts around and there's four cars piled on top of each other and flames shooting out. You want a comet truck, maybe a couple fire trucks, an ambulance or two, a couple police cars. So you're able to, that system is able to uh, detect, verify, clarify, and then dispatch. So the comet trucks, I think, help illustrate that, you know, that relationship we were talking about earlier about the relationship between ITS and system management. Let's see, ramp meters was another, is another example that hasn't come up yet. Ramp meters is something, you know, another example of using technology to allow us to manage the freeways. I mean, we can keep going. Um, travel information is one that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, but I think it's another, there's a lot of technology that supports a system, and it's something that is also pretty advanced in this region. So um, the last things in this Portland section that I wanted to talk about is how, does, how in Portland do we plan for operations? Um, and this is just sort of specific information that I wanted you to know about if you're not already familiar. Um, Metro, if you're not already aware, is the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the region. Metro has a whole committee structure. Um, JPAC and TPAC are the committees that are involved in making the capital investment strategies. TPAC, which is made up of senior planning staff from all the agencies in the region, have, has a number of subcommittees. And one of those subcommittees is called Transport, which is a committee of... Uh, ITS professionals from pretty much every public agency in the region, including across the river in Washington, from the MPO there and from the city of Vancouver, Clark County, Washington State DOT, CTRAN. So it has uh, bi-state membership. And what, th what happens at transport is a lot of the examples that we've talked about, from the fiber network to the cameras to the incident management, it's at transport where people will come together and say, okay, uh, we're a PDOT. We're working on a project. And ODOT might say, oh, you know, that's, that's really overlapping with something we're doing. Let's, let's get together on that. So having this committee, um, which meets monthly, is just an opportunity. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a fundamental tool that we have in the region for facilitating collaborative transportation operations planning. You, you, you need to have that forum for the discussion to occur. I mean, each agent, as we've talked about, each agency is very capable of doing its own work. But if you say, you know, as we've talked about, we've sort of established the case here for why agencies need to talk to each other. Well, if you just stop there, yes, it's a great idea, but you have to create a means for that to happen. And often, to make something like that happen, you need to have something specific. You need to have a specific project that brings people together. And I think one of the remarkable things about transport is that it's a group that's been meeting for, I think, I think it began meeting in 92 or 93, so we're talking about something over 10 years of, of experience, of people coming together. You know, in staff changes, you have some turnover, so someone leaves, someone new comes in. So here's a community where these ideas are tossed around. You have that forum. And this doesn't always work, but transport, I think, is an excellent example of an of a organization or an institution, a committee, where without you know, one kind of firecracker idea that they, they have to come together to work on, this is a group that just keeps coming together because of the fundamental benefit of working together on ITS and transportation operations. So that's a pretty special thing. So if you're graduating, going back to other parts of the country, you can go forth and bring the wisdom of transport. Uh, the other thing that's, um, I think, special about uh, Portland is this. I talked about the fiber network. There's a group um, of representatives from the different agencies uh, called the uh, Cooperative Telecommunications Infrastructure Committee, or Collaborative, CTIC, C-T-I-C. So that's, again, a group, of, a committee structure of representatives from the different agencies in the region that come together to work on how that fiber network will be built and maintained. In this case, you have a committee that has a very specific mission. They, their mission is to build this network out, identify opportunities to create, you know, to address missing links in the fiber network, to identify new users of that network and figure out how it's going to work. So you have transport and you have CTIC, and I think they really illustrate on the transport side a committee that meets and just meets consistently for the sake, you know, really for maintaining the level of trust among agencies. And you have CTIC, which is an organization that has a very specific mission to accomplish and kind of is, is sustained by that, um, by that focus. The last question I want to pose, and this is one that's really challenging um, metropolitan areas throughout the country, um, is what the role of the MPO should be. Um, and I ought to pause just to ask, um, are people familiar with a metropolitan planning organization, with Metro, is the MPO here in Portland? Is anybody not familiar with the role of an MPO? Okay, so I can take that. 
So an MPO, you know, you know here is uh, Metro does land use planning. We developed the 2040 growth concept and are now renewing that through the new look process. There's the long-range transportation plan, which is updated now every four years, um, which is also in the process of being updated right now. So for an agency that does transportation planning, what role does Metro, should Metro have in transportation operations? And think about some of the points that we've made so far today, some of the things we've talked about. What, what role can an MPO play in transportation operations? Yeah, Chris? Well, Metro doesn't operate any roads. That's correct. Um, so I think the, the primary role is probably as convener to get the parties that do have the resources together. Right. I think what you're, what's implicit in your statement is that we have ODOT, TriMet, PDOT, the counties, the port, you know, agencies that have specific responsibility to operate facilities, and Metro does, well, has the zoo. <laughs> so, uh, the convention center, sorry. Sorry, guys. Uh, so, you know, we, so the, the, the point is, how does an agency that doesn't have specific operational responsibilities get involved, and one idea is to play the, con the regional convener? I think that's a good point. Yep, Max? Does, does Metro have control over funding for operations at all? Does it have... The first part of your sentence was easy. Metro has a lot of control over funding, you know, the point that you have to plan in order to get the money. Um, but funding for operations is a little tricky because a lot of the pots of money from the feds have pretty strict limitations on what they can be spent on. There are a few cases in which federal transportation money can be spent on operations, but it's usually time limited. Um, so most of the money that flows through Metro is not for operations. It's usually for building or repairing infrastructure. Metro will also um, have pretty much you know, the insight and all the information about regional trends when it comes to land use planning and transportation planning and basically coordinating the two. So sort of knowing what's happening yeah. in the system and kind of where the, I would, I would elaborate on that by saying knowing where there are maybe choke points or problems and also going back to Gene's point, knowing where things are forecast to go. I mean, when you bring in a new, uh, you know, uh, population area into the urban growth boundary, and you have to look at what, what effects that's going to have. Any other thoughts about Metro's role? I think we've hit it. I mean, I think that that's really the key thing. Um, I hope that I've made the case to you that because it's so important to plan for operations regionally, um, I don't mean to be glib, but it's, you know, getting the kids to play nicely in the sandbox. It's hard to have a peer enforce rules on a peer, right? And it's hard to set the rules of the game that you're playing. So it's helpful to have sort of a Switzerland, a neutral party, who's not, who doesn't have a specific stake in operating the infrastructure, play that role of convener. So I think it's fairly established in the region and in other metropolitan areas that the MPO plays the convener role and does that in a neutral manner. It develops policies, but it doesn't have a stake in the specific infrastructure. And so I think that what a lot of areas in the country are dealing with now is figuring out how to use the MPO to move into the operations area. And one of the challenges is that the staff of most MPOs is not, a, is not prepared or not experienced on some of the specific topics that has to do with operations. And I mentioned at the very beginning that I'm in this unusual arrangement where I'm a PDOT employee housed at Metro, and that was specifically that idea. When we got this grant, and PDOT was the host agency, so the feds write a check to PDOT, but the idea was let's house this position at Metro so that there's somebody at the MPO who's thinking and focused on transportation operations and ITS issues. You know, there are other MPOs that have a certain engineering function. They have safety engineers. They have project engineers. And so those are individuals who can sort of play, can kind of move into that role. Uh, Metro hasn't been one of those. So that's one of the things that Metro is dealing with right now is how to develop that institutional knowledge. And, I think one of the important things is how to gain the trust of the agencies that do have the operational responsibility. I mean, if you've ever sort of walked onto the playground and you're the new kid, you're not always welcomed right away. So figuring out how to establish that you're going to play and you're going to play nice and, and, and contribute is a challenge. Any other thoughts about Metro? Yep. Well, it's speaking of Bill, his, uh, one of his all-time favorite concepts is the pin map that it used to be back in the back in the days before we had electronic communications that you would put different colored pins on a map and then people could tell sort of what the order of the day was. And I think that it, it might be possible that Metro should be in that business or should consider being in that business 
that if we knew where every sewer tap was going to be or every every festival or whatever and those could be mapped in real time or at least once a day uh, I think that could be a could be a big advance we're working on that in Portland transportation but when you when you think about what a small uh, uh, perspective we have with our with our, the things that we know about what we would then be able to do would be to say oh wow well maybe we should wait a week until so and so is off the street right I think one of the classic examples of that is uh, uh, you have the uh, sensors in the ro you know in the pavement at an intersection to get a trigger for a signal and how many instances do you have of you know you install the sensor and it turns out that a month or a year later they're going to be they're planning to come through and repave that street, and so you've just spent money on the sensor, and they're going to pave it. You're going to put it back in, or you always uh, if you've ever seen you know they come through and do uh, a sewer repair right after you've repaved resurfaced the street. And you think oh it was beautiful pavement, perfect for biking on, and now they've gone and torn it up. So I think that kind of coordination is a great example, um, and I think I think it's certainly been my impression since arriving here that Metro you know the data resource center plays that role of clearinghouse for information in the region. Yeah. But that does mean that you have to have a, a communications protocol, mm -hmm. both both in terms of the plan and then also the electronic versions. And that mm -hmm. stuff is, is very, very difficult. It's very easy to sort of wave your hands and talk about how nice it's going to be when we get there. Mm -hmm. But when you get down to the actual details, uh, there's a lot of little loose ends. All right, um, home stretch. I have one last section to talk about, um, and that is I've mentioned this grant that funds my position. So um, when I'm not here talking to you, I've got responsibilities to um, satisfy the uh, prescription of the federal agency that the, the Office of Federal Highway that gave us this grant. Um, and so this is your third and final term for the day, um, and it's called the Regional Concept of Transportation Operations, or RCTO, or ARCTO. Like I said, I really like those uh, cute little acronyms. So a regional concept, I, I don't want to harp on the term too much. It, it pulls together a lot of the things that we've been talking about here. Um, and the, the, the key word is vision. I've talked about, you know, for operations and for planning, wanting to know where you're going or where you want to go and then how to get there. And we've talked about how operations um, is vulnerable to being uh, in a sort of brush fire mode and not having the opportunity to plan strategically. The, the thrust of this grant from Federal Highway um, is to demonstrate when Portland is one of three cities in the country along with uh, Detroit and Tucson to get this grant to, to kind of try out this new concept from Federal Highways to say, pick an operational topic, pick, a, pick an example of TISMO and develop a vision of where you want to be with that in, in, in what in the operations context would be a reasonable length in the future, maybe, fi you know, f maybe five years in the future. And pick and go through and develop as a region your vision for that service. Um, again, I made that distinction earlier about outputs versus outcomes. Think about the outcomes. What, you know, for, for a particular topic, what do you want the outcomes to be? And then have that vision guide the investments you make and the kind of work that you do uh, in your interagency relationships. So this ARCTO grant we have for two years, and what we what the transport committee, this ITS committee of Metro decided to do was to focus um, the ARCTO work on the topic of travel information. So before I go further, is there anybody who doesn't know what I mean by travel information? Is that a familiar term? Um, has anybody used, we talked about TripCheck, the cameras on TripCheck. Um, has anybody used TriMet's Transit Tracker? Oh yeah, every day. <laughs> every day. Has anybody used Chris's Transit Surfer? Yep, one, one yeah. modest head shaking. So. <laughs> And not just pure pandering, right? <laughs> so these are services. Um, transit, we'll use a transit tra tracker example. Um, these are services that, s that allow you in real time to get information about transportation system. In the example, example of transit tracker, it'll say when the next time that a bus, you know, if you want, let's see, I could take the number nine bus from right outside this building to my house. So I could look up and find, I can go on the web or use my phone um, and find out exactly when the next number nine bus is coming to this stop. Um, on the ODOT side, they have trip check. Among the things you can do there, you can pull up a camera. Uh, you know, so you can see what the road condition looks like up on Mount Hood. You can pull up the speed map, which shows you what the traffic conditions are um, on the region's highways. There's a lot of different things you can do to get real-time information. 
Now, most of the things I've just mentioned are outputs, right? You can, we can produce video images. We can produce speed maps. We can send tons of data about where buses are in real time. But the purpose of doing an Arcto to develop a vision and an implementation plan for something like travel information is to define what our vision is for the future. Okay? So what would be some outcomes that we would want from traveler information in the future? What do you, why, why do we do traveler information? What result do we want it to have? Mm -hmm. Can, LAX has that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, LAX has a radio station to avoid bottlenecks. You can uh, just push the. I think it's six eighty a.m. Yeah. And you'll hear what what's going on. Right. I think and the radios are a classic. You know, as I said, I grew up on the East Coast, and in Philadelphia, you know, ten sixty, you know, traffic on the twos all day long. You just tune in. In New York, it's eight eighty. Traffic on the eights. You know, lots of. I mean, I'm sure we could do it. Where's everybody from? I'm sure you have an example of the radio station that has traffic every 10 minutes or every 15 minutes. I think that's the, you know, the, I'm sorry? Except here. Is there a radio station that does that here? KEX. Yeah. 1190. <laughs> there you go. Look what we've learned today. <laughs> Learning has been achieved. So I think that um, radio is sort of the original, maybe the, one of the original forms of, of real-time traveler information. Um, but if you've ever been in the instance where I can think of a million times. I've been driving. I'm approaching, you know, like here would be the, the split between 5 and 205. And you know that the traffic report comes on every, you know, every 10 minutes on the twos. You're looking at your clock, you know, and it's, it's 150. It's 151. You're getting close to the intersection. You pull into the right lane. You start driving a little slower. Come on, traffic report. Come on, <laughs> traffic report. So where, you know, these new services, web services that you can get on your phone are sort of the next generation of that to help you avoid you know, like we talked about earlier, the difference between recurring and non-recurring. Probably, don't, we, we know ourselves that you don't want to drive across the interstate bridge right now, or at least not northbound. You know, so that's recurring congestion. But you would want to know: is there an accident? You know, yes, we know that there's the typical choke points, but are there unusual things? Is there an, is there an incident disrupting traffic right now today, and I want to seek an alternate route? Um, so it's very useful for that kind of thing. Are there other outcomes that travel information can help us achieve? Yeah, Max. You might want different mode choices to be easier to make. Okay. Can like, you give an example? Um, transit, uh, yeah, transit tracker can make it, it more reliable to take a bus rather than driving your car. You know, I, I've, I've heard lots of people uh, who say I'm not comfortable taking the bus because when the bus pulls up, I have no idea where it's going. Or if you're one of the, you know, if you're on the bus mall, how do you know which bus it is? Well, some of this kinds of travel information can maybe make the thought as make it make more people comfortable with taking the bus, therefore more people take the bus, fewer people driving, less congestion. Okay, that's an outcome. Chris? Well, the outcome that personally motivated me to develop Transit Surfer is I hate standing at bus stops. So I'm going to walk until the bus catches up with me and a tool like Transit Surfer lets me know when that's going to happen. So it's save, the way I would paraphrase is that it saves you time. You know, if you are going by paper schedule, you might walk out, the bus, the bus might have gotten stuck in festival traffic, and so you're, you know, you were there on time. Bus wasn't. You were standing there for ten minutes until, if you, but if you had your phone or your internet, now you're finding out that it's, now that it's ten minutes late. So now you can, go there exactly when it's going to arrive. I like to think about aggregating all those minutes saved, you know, across the region. And just like you hear, you know, you hear uh, about once a year when the Texas Institute does this study and it says, oh, traffic, you know, rush hour costs Americans so many billions of dollars a year. I like to think of the reverse of saying services like travel information save us, you know, because our time is valuable, right? We all value that, which is why I'm going to end on time today. So does anybody have any other thoughts about the outcomes that result from travel information? Yeah, Jen, well, please. I was just going to say that uh, the taxpayers uh, feel better or uh, appreciate the quality of the transportation system, that there's just having that benefit is good. Yeah, I think that's true. I think everybody's happier when they're not stuck in a traffic jam. Any other benefits? How about, um, okay, Peter. Are, are we on the, so where are we? Are we in B? The region's vision for oh, travel okay. information. Well, I'll wait for C then. Oh, okay. Uh-oh. <laughs> Sorry, folks, that's all the time we have today. <laughs> um, I brought up the example of the parking information, you know, and those signs that tell you where to go. 
Um, there's some cities that have a service now where you, you sort of, anybody use flex car, car sharing? Um, there's some cities that have sort of parking space sharing, so you can click and reserve your parking spot. Um, I've noticed I've bought concert tickets or uh, sporting event tickets on Ticketmaster, and you can now buy uh, your parking, uh, you know, whatever, your, your parking pass before you go. So there's services to help, you know, again, if, if it's true that 30% of congestion downtown is related to people looking for parking, and we can tell them where to find their parking, we can potentially reduce the amount of congestion downtown. I think the point I'm trying to hammer is that we think about what we want. This is a service. Travel information is a, is a service or a system, you know, something that fits under that heading of TISMO. And the way we think about it, when we come up with our vision, you know, when we think about what our vision is as a region for travel information, we can think about what the outcomes are that we want. It's very easy to think, wow, I love gadgets. I want everybody to have a little PDA so they can get bus times. Or I like those web pages that have traffic cameras, or I like those signs over the highway, or I like the plasma screen TVs at the bus stops, or whatever it is. I mean, it's easy and it's fun to fixate on the technology and the outputs, but from a planning perspective, the essential difference is to think about the outcomes, to say we want fewer people to be, when there's an incident, and there will be incidents, but when there's an incident, we want less person time stuck in traffic. Right? So that's, that's our vision for the outcome. We want fewer people stuck in avoidable delay. Right? So then the purpose of the RCTO, the ARCTO process, is to back up and say, if, that's where we, if, if in five years, we could have, I mean, you could get really specific. Right? You could say, we want the number of people who get stuck in and that behind an accident to be reduced by 45%, you know, just making up numbers here. Then you would say, well, how do we achieve that? If in five years we want that fact to be true, you know, how do we achieve that? What are the things that we need? Now, if we're starting from scratch, we need to start with cameras and fiber optic cable and detectors and an operations center. We have a lot of that stuff. So for us to come up with a vision, what we're working on right now is to come up with that vision you know, further in. You know, kind of what's the next thing we do? We have some pretty remarkable with TripCheck and Transit Tracker and Transit Surfer. We have some pretty good services here in Portland, but what's the next layer? Recently, ODOT and WashDOT have gotten together so that when you look at that speed map, it has data not only for Oregon, but also for Washington. Because it turns out that, you know, there's congestion on both sides of the river. And you don't want to go to one, one website to find out one set of information and have to go to another website to find another set of information. So these are the changes that are happening. So the RCTO process is based on coming up with that vision. One of the other things that's been added recently um, has been uh, that travel information would help us in the event of an emergency if we needed to do an evacuation. So in addition to helping people sort of at the commuter level or at the visitor traveler level, it would also help us in the event of an emergency to, have, to tell people, you know, don't try to go across that bridge because the earthquake crumbled it. You know, bad idea. So there's, there, there are other outcomes that we can talk about for that specific topic. So right now what we're in the, we had a workshop in late April, and there's going to be another workshop on June 21st at Metro where we're working on this vision to, ref, to kind of move it forward and, and refine what Portland metropolitan area's re, you know, regional vision is for transportation operations. So it's connecting up with what we talked about, that that's sort of the first step in planning for operations regionally, coming up with a vision, articulating what outcomes we want in the future, and then going through a process of developing an implementation plan to say, what do we have to do to get there? And that's going to be made up of what does the city of Portland need to do? What does TriMet need to do? What does ODOT need to do? What does the private sector need to do? And then as you keep going down, some of the essential questions that we're going to be asking is, not only does what individual agency need to do on their own, but what are the relationships you need? I just mentioned having traffic information that is consistent, you know, that connects between Washington and Oregon. Well, that requires an, you know, an, an institutional relationship between the two states, between WashDOT and ODOT. So what are the relationships that we need to build? I mean, you need hardware, but there's also the sort of the people side, the people power. So that's the thing. Now, there was this, oh, yeah, you want Once we're done with this, this RCTO, this ARCTO for travel information, the next question that we're going to ask ourselves is, well, this was a fun experience. This was good and productive. When we came up with a vision and we came up with an implementation plan, what's next? What are the other topics for which we should begin articulating a vision for these regional operation strategies. And I have a feeling that a member of the audience wants to contribute here. There's, a, there's an informal carpooling system in the Washington, D.C. area called slugging. Slugging. And it's been in, in operation for about 35 years now. 
Yeah. And and basically what it is is a means of letting people fill their car up so they can utilize the high occupancy vehicle lanes. Right. And I think that that's something that the internet could could make happen. In the reason, probably the reason that it's working there is because it's such a high density of people who are going from the suburbs to the Pentagon, for instance. Right. The Pentagon is such a huge uh, destination and origin. So it's been practical there on a very informal basis. It might be more practical here uh, in, a, in a less target rich environment, if you'll excuse the expression. The, 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 I won't. Okay, sorry. <laughs> that where where we could actually have that happen uh, electronically. Right. Yeah. Um, what it, what were the topics of the Detroit and Tucson studies? Uh, Detroit's. I, I'm afraid. Sorry if you're watching. Uh, I I don't remember Tucson's. Um, Detroit's is uh, sort of incident management oriented. So I think that's one of the topics that's likely to come out. I, you know, people have already brought up doing incident management as one of the next R RCTOs here. Any other thoughts? Actually, uh, sort of speaking of incident management, we did have someone email in a question who was uh, watching on the web related to incident management, and um, so I. As long as they're not one of my office mates at Metro, because they were no, threatening to be No, it's one of our tough. students. Excellent. Uh, who's we'll a take fan of Comet? A uh, simple question is: Are there similar systems elsewhere in Oregon to Comet? To Comet. Uh, I'm, unfortunately, I'm sorry. I'm uh, new enough to Oregon that I don't know. Ed Odot, do you know? Yeah, we have uh, the Region 2 Salem that goes on a couple of the state highways down in the Salem, and I think we're looking at uh, getting one up running in the Bend area mm -hmm. soon. There are a lot of different models. If, if, if there's someone who's interested in that uh, type of program, I mean, lots of different cities have models. Um, some of them are, uh, you know, owned by, you know, ODOT owns the highways, owns the Comet fleet. Um, there are other uh, sort of public-private relationships, so it would be pretty easy to survey uh, different metropolitan areas and find different models of Comet-type programs. Any other? Yep. I'm just curious um, where something like traffic calming would fit into this scheme that you're talking about? Traffic calming, going back to the very beginning, and I talked about how TISMO is sort of a new term but not a new concept, I think of traffic calming as um, a, cl a, a great classic example of trans you know, transportation system management, you know, something that you do to certainly you know, makes the system work better. I also think it's, a, it's something that I, I haven't talked about, but m I think a lot of the TISMO type strategies are aimed at speeding up traffic. Um, and that's not always necessary. I think we know most. Of, I think we know that most of that not always the way to make your infrastructure work better isn't always to speed it up. Sometimes it's to slow it down. Um, so traffic calming. I think that's why traffic calming is a class is sort of a class example of TSM. So I think by extension, it's in. It, I don't. I don't know what you would what you know uh, user service package you would label it under. But I. I think it fits under the Tismo heading. I think it's you know it's. I think maybe one of the things that's different about it is most m most of the traffic calming applications that I think of are infrastructure. You know, something that you go out and build and put material in the ground, you know, change intersection geometry, um, or design treatments. Um, so it's so it might be a little bit of a stretch in the you know in an operations context. Um, but I, I don't think that Tismo is absent. You know, uh, physical improvements. I think some of them are hardware oriented. Any other questions? Any thoughts about future Arcto topics going back? Yeah? Can I ask you a question? I'm asking this as a user of the transportation system, <laughs> not as uh -oh. a planning professor. <laughs> Just a little pet peeve. Um, has there been any um, analysis or look at those overhead message signs? And because my observation is they just they cause a bottleneck at the sign because mm -hmm. they slow down traffic because people are trying to read it because there's a lot of text on there. Um, has anyone looked at that and tried to figure out sort of how to really word, how to do those well, I guess? I don't, know. Um, I don't have a citation for you. I know that they're evaluated. I, I can think of one anecdote. I don't remember the location. I know there's there's one sign south of the city that sort of, Infamous, you know, at the operations center at ODOT for 
caught, you know, uh, that people, I think it has to, I think, um, don't quote me, don't quote me, uh, it, I think it has, you know, there's, a, there's an angle of approach issue where you, you don't see it clearly until you're really close to it, so it's, uh, there, you know, maybe it's a design issue. Um, I know that uh, when you develop those systems, you the, the develop you know, design in the design process. You think very carefully about the messages that you put up. Um, you know, one of the common use, one of the major reasons for having those very message signs is to support the Amber Alert system for when uh, children are, are missing or abducted. Uh, and there's a very standard message set for deploying that information. Um, there are some signs that are simply for travel time, you know, especially if there's sort of two, uh, you know, if there's, a, if there's a piece of infrastructure where you really have two parallel options uh, and it says, you know, option, you know, travel time this way is that, travel time that way is that. Um, so, you know, they tend towards a very sort of straightforward message. I think a lot of the times where people have at least anecdotal evidence of the signs causing delay is when the message is more complex. And so as we've learned, Operating those systems, it's you know, to work towards simpler, more apparent messages. Have you asked Robert Fitz that question? I, I think I probably have. I, I, it bothers me, I, and I think part of it is the message. I mean, I, the ones I observe, I mean, they tell you that it's the left-hand lane five miles west. I don't need to know. Just stall five miles ahead. I mean, it, it seems like that there's more detail than they than they mm -hmm. need, perhaps, but. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, you know, some of the television stations now, you know, they'll show the major, you know, the freeway system and mm -hmm. some of the highways, the flow of traffic in different colors. Yep. And I don't know if that's coming from um, ODOT or if that's mm -hmm. their own generation and see if that can be expanded. It's a lot more visual and probably it doesn't yeah. have text and people can just see that really quick. Um, that system starts with uh, the loop detectors in the pavement on the interstates and sends the data to ODOT. <laughs> um, and then ODOT makes the information available. You know, the distinction, the, the comment that's usually made by folks at an agency like ODOT is that their transportation professionals are not communication professionals or public information officers. And so the, the model for disseminating this kind of information you know, ODOT's reason for collecting it is to decide, is to detect accidents and dispatch Comet and, and manage the infrastructure. And then it's an ancillary benefit that they can use that data to provide travel information. Uh, so ODOT collects the data and then makes it available so that websites and TV stations can pick it up. Yeah. So I know there are also, there are some um, new services, some private services that would allow you to program in your commute. You know, so if you commute from here to Vancouver, you program that in, and it can alert you if there's something wrong on your route or recommend an alternate sort of a customized map quest kind of thing. Um, but I th there's, there's a push um, to sort of get the most value out of that kind of data um, and to share it. I was, really, I was uh, pleasantly just surprised to see that now if you watch the Weather Channel in the morning, they have uh, traffic information scrolling across the bottom, and then they flash up the speed, the speed map. But that's a... That speed map is sort of ODOT speed map, and websites and uh, television stations can pick that up and transmit it. Thinking about traveler information, and as our communities become more diverse, and I've noticed that more and more of the messages on um, Macs are also done in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And are you thinking about traveler information being done multilingual? Now I am. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, the, since we've just been talking about the speed map, um, some of that is not, not lingual. It's alingual, right? Uh, so I guess the interesting thing, you know, I'm, I'm thinking off the cuff here, but I think as much it's the supporting information or, or the information that shows you how to get the data. You know, if you go to Transit Tracker, um, a lot of the data is if you use the web or something. Um, is you know you're just looking at the times, uh, you know you're picking out a street address, you know you're picking out a, an intersection and it's telling you know a, a bus route, an intersection and it's telling you times, um, but the directions on how to use that, I think is an interesting question. I don't know um, what TriMet plans are for Transit Tracker, for example, uh, but I think that's in terms of an outcome perspective, I think that's important. Yeah. 
I was just wondering if in other parts of the country that are already more heavily Hispanic or some other ethnic group, if there is um, experience from those areas that you could draw on. Hmm. Well, I will eagerly look into it, I'll tell you that. Yeah, Jennifer. Okay. We actually have a yeah. good question from the web, better than my previous question. Ah, it went away. Oh, shoot. Uh, some ad popped up. Uh, the question had to do <laughs> I hope with... it wasn't an ad for travel information services. <laughs> no. Uh, I just got this new thing. I'm not working it very well. But the question had to do with um, sort of coordination cooperation between sort of public agencies in the private sector, in particular auto manufacturers, and whether there's any partnerships that are going to sort of help build in the technology into vehicles that will sort of help enable a lot of this stuff. Uh, there's uh, a person who's interested in that question should um, I would I would get, have to tell them to start on Google and type in um, it's the VII Vehicle Infrastructure Initiative. Did it, Chris, do you or um, it's sort of it's one of the major uh, US DOT um, areas of effort is to you know they have many many lines of effort but uh, connect it you know working public-private partnerships to, to address that, uh, not only in terms of travel information, but also in terms of safety systems. Um, sort of, uh, th there are, there are far-fetched dream things, but there are also quite a few very practical, um, especially in the safety area, things that can, um, people are working on so that the vehicle is in communication with the infrastructure, which can alert you to, you know, staying in your lane is a classic example or alerting you that your exit's coming up, kind of thing. I mean, I, I think from a technology generation perspective, we're going from, you know, the point, you know, we, well, we had the radio. We talked about having the radio. But now you're seeing, you know, uh, the dashboard uh, navigation systems. So I think that you're, you know, you're, you're moving forward. You know, how do you get, in addition to downloading a satellite image of your map, how, you know, can you download traffic information or, or other types of things? Anything else from the web? Well, no, some credit card thing. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. It's the first time I've used this. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> so there could be something here, and I'm just not able to get at it yet. Okay. So if someone else has a question. Anybody? It is. Oh, yep, one more. Is there anybody looking into uh, that type of GPS system, dashboard GPS system that uh, has parking information in the Portland area? In the Portland area, not that I know of. Um, I think that there's, when you think about a system like that, you have to first start by creating the information. You know, with the, with the speed map, you have to start by having loop detectors in the pavement to generate the data about travel times or speeds on the highway. So in the parking case, you have to start by having the data about where the parking is available. You know, I, I, don't, have, I don't have any experience with those in kind of in-car navigation systems. I, I imagine some could be programmed to identify where there are parking garages, but in terms of the question of real-time, you know, uh, availability, you know, you'd have to start by having the data available, and then you'd have to create the handshake. You know, I guess on one end you'd have to start by having the data available. On the other hand, you'd have to have a system in the car that allows you to get real-time information, and then you'd have to figure out how to handshake between those those systems. Nobody's working on that yet. Uh, I would be surprised if nobody was working on it generally. I mean, I know that, we, you know, like I said, uh, the airport here in Portland is uh, deploying the system so that you know, you know, you'll, you'll pull up and it'll say so many spots on this floor, so many spots on that floor, kind of a thing. Um, so whether we deploy that technology on downtown parking garages is partly a public and partly a private sector question. And then what, you know, the, the way we share data in the region is set up so that information can be made available just as the real-time speed data is made available. Um, and that has to do with the communication infrastructure that we have in place. But what, what happens once the, you know, we talked about the news channels pick up the speed data and put that on their broadcast. If we put out the parking information, which is what the port is going to do, you know, that, and that allows a private sector entity to create a service to grab that data and make it available. You know, so whether it's you know, a phone number or a website or, or anything, whether it communicates to your car is the other question. So from the, you know, most of these things work where 
the public sector does its part and creates the information and then works for the private sector to do its part. Okay, I think that's it. No more questions from the web. I want to thank you very much. Our last speaker of the year. And I think it well, congratulations to well. those of you who are so, graduating. Thank you. And to those of you who are taking the summer off, enjoy. Thank you.